Okay, it is 630. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everybody for logging in tonight. My name is um, Candace Hart and I'm a horticulture educator with U of I Extension and I serve um, three counties in the central uh, portion of the state. And today we are talking about gardening as therapy. So I've had um, quite a bit of experience with this throughout my time as a ed extension educator here because we've had a lot of great um, volunteer groups, a lot of great projects that have happened um, that have revolved, revolved around this particular um, topic. So we're going to kind of go through today kind of what exactly is gardening as therapy, um, kind of some activity ideas, different things we can do to incorporate um, this type of programming or this type of thing into our uh, into our gardening. So uh, we all know you're on this call probably because you're gardeners, of course. So uh, we all know that gardening is one of the most popular activities in the U.S. and probably almost uh, worldwide. And that's for a lot of reasons. Um, for one thing, it's accessible. Almost anybody can garden on some level, whether it's just planting a, a seed into a, a small planter or a large scale um, garden. It's also intergenerational. Any uh, race, ethnicity, anybody can get involved with, with gardening. So it's a very diverse group of people typically that are coming together um, uh, to garden. And of course, a lot of us do it because it's economical. It's cheaper to do it ourselves. It's cheaper to grow our own food. Um, so especially vegetable gardening, that's a big plus there. And then, of course, what this is focusing on, of course, that so we all know we've gardened. We've experienced that therapeutic um, kind of feeling that we get when we're out in that garden, kind of that peacefulness. We can shut our minds off um, and just kind of focus on being present um, in the garden. So it's great in terms of therapy for the mind, uh, but also for the body and motor skills and things like that, which we'll talk about. So if we look at history, the we'll talk about AHTA, the American Therapeutic Horticulture Association. They've put a lot of different information together about kind of the history of, of gardening as therapy. And I won't read through all of this, but you can see that um, clearly this isn't a new um, topic in gardening. This isn't a new thing in gardening. Um, it's been happening since the late 1700s. Um, early 1800s, um, they were starting to get an understanding of a people-plant connection um, that began to evolve into an approach for treatment um, for different clinical things. Um, in the late um, 1700s, they announced um, that they would have a, a field labor in a farm setting, and they found that it had curative effects on people who were mentally ill. Um, and that just kind of uh, continued on. By 1879, the hospital installed their first greenhouse solely for this uh, purposes. Um, 1896, with the early mention of using plants and gardening as uplifting activities for disadvantaged youth. Okay, so now we're looking more uh, into youth as well as adults. And then into the 1900s, um, we began the use of horticulture therapy in physical disability programming for uh, World War One vets, and then of course continued that to World War um, Two vets, and then after World War Two, began the involvement of garden club volunteers in hospital wards across the nation, um, and this is what's really uh, kind of established horticulture programming in those type of facilities. Uh, it kind of started back then. And then to today, um, so in the 50s, the National Council of State Garden Clubs named horticulture therapy as one of their objectives, and so that still remains one. You could do a Master of Science in Horticulture Therapy starting in 1955. And then moving on to 73, I mentioned the American Horticulture Society Association that was established, which um, they have a lot of resources, research um, conferences around that particular topic. So we might think of it, and I think some of us people in extension think of it as maybe a new trendy kind of programming or new trendy thing to do as gardeners, but it's certainly not a new uh, idea of using gardening as a form of, of therapy. So I want to start with some um, some definitions a little bit because you'll you'll hear the terms horticultural therapy thrown around. You'll hear the terms therapeutic horticulture thrown around, and they're not the exact um, same thing. There are differences uh, between the two of those. So these again come from AHTA. They define everything uh, very well on their um, website. So if we look at horticultural therapy, uh, this is the use of professionally directed plant gardening and nature activities 
applied therapeutically for the purpose of restoring the physical and mental health of its participants. Okay, the key here is that horticultural therapists are trained uh, to help people grow healthier in body, mind, and spirit. Okay, so the emphasis here is on uh, training. There's typically you need a particular degree in horticultural therapy or a certificate program. There's some type of training program that you go through in order to become a, a certified horticultural therapist. So this involves a lot more uh, kind of background knowledge, a lot more training than some of the other things we're going to uh, talk about. So in that training, of course, those therapists can evaluate the abilities and needs of the individual that they're working with so they can match that person's needs, skills, interests to the particular activities that would go well with that particular um, individual. And there's usually goals involved. So whatever the, uh, the person who's involved in the therapy program their goals might be to maybe increase muscle strength, improve their social skills, improve their self-esteem, just have a healing kind of rest, restorative process. So there would be a lot of types of goals involved here. But the key in, in the person that's a horticultural therapist is that they're, they are trained, they're able to assess the needs of an individual and kind of establish um, clear goals. Okay. Those activities then that they define for that particular person, they might be indoors, they might be outdoors, it just depends on where this is happening. And more than likely, it's probably going to include plants of some kind, whether it's growing plants, uh, floral design, garden maintenance, the activities are uh, almost endless. And then, of course, the therapist then is trained to know what kind of support is needed for that individual, whether they need adaptive devices, physical assistance, how accessible is the area, that type of thing. So horticulture therapy is a much more trained, um, kind of defined uh, program than some of these others that we're going to, to look at. So I mentioned you, we also hear the term therapeutic horticulture. And uh, when I use, when I do these programs, I try to avoid using the term of uh, therapeutic, sorry, <laughs> horticultural therapy, because I'm not a trained horticulture therapist. So I tend to use some of these other terms that we're going to be talking about here, like therapeutic horticulture. So what this is, is a process that uses plants and plant activities through which a participant can improve their well-being through active or passive involvement. So they could be actively involved in an activity, they could be watching an activity and, uh, and improving um, that way. There's no clinical kind of goals set aside here because uh, we're not necessarily trained uh, to do that. Uh, but we would have a leader typically in this type of setting that would have some training in horticulture used as a, a medium for human uh, well-being. Okay, so different than a horticulture therapist, not as much training involved here, not clear defined goals. Um, so we're kind of going down the line in terms of um, expertise here, we could we could say. The other term that you might hear thrown around would be something like social horticulture or uh, community horticulture. And what this is, is basically a leisure or recreational activity related to plants and gardening. Okay, so basically, we're maybe we're coming into a an assisted living facility. Um, we're providing an activity that's recreational. We're teaching them a little bit about plants, a little bit about gardening. But really, our goal here is to kind of create a community, uh, get that particular group of residents socializing, working together, working as a team. We don't really have treatment goals because we are not. Uh, typically at the particular facility that we're doing this activity um, and there's no therapy therapist present there's usually a staff person but not necessarily a, a therapist so this photo here is a master gardener uh, one of the master gardeners that I've worked with that does some great um, uh, programming here so if we're thinking about a volunteer project with uh, master gardeners different volunteers this is kind of more what we're talking about is kind of a social horticulture, community horticulture type of activity. And then we've probably heard also the term vocational horticulture. And this is a program um, or a training training that focuses on providing training to enable individuals to work in the horticulture um, industry. They, the individual who's doing this may or may not have a disability. They may be in a different, in many different types of facilities, but these type of programs you will find commonly at juvenile detention centers, um, correctional centers, um, where the goal is to provide some actual hands-on skills uh, that a participant could then um, 
take with them um, out into the, the public and to hopefully achieve a job where they could use those um, skills. That would be vocational uh, horticulture. So a little bit different in terms of our, our goals here where we're actually trying to teach a, a, a hard skill. Okay, so where is this stuff happening? Where are this where is this kind of gardening as therapy happening? Lots of places. So uh, a lot of medical facilities, hospitals, rehabilitation centers, uh, neurological recovery programs, nursing homes, assisted living communities, um, day and drop in programs, whether that's youth or adults, um, schools social programs, group homes, anywhere there's a there's a particular audience that has a need um, for this type of, of, of gardening and um, and therapy, uh, this type of thing can, can happen. And it can be even as small as working with someone you know. It doesn't necessarily have to be a large group of people that, that we're doing these type of activities with. It could be your uh, a parent or a grandparent. It could be um, someone that you know um, that, that could use some of that type of assistance. So obviously there's a lot of research to back up uh, this type of, of work and the, the AHGA um, has a lot of that linked on their, their website. But the research of course shows overwhelming evidence to support the positive benefits of this in the areas of cognitive, psychological, social, physical development and healing. So a lot of different areas where these type of activities can and promote a lot of great things in, in, within an audience. Um, again, here's some of that some of that research that comes from AHTA. Uh, so some of the positive impacts they've seen on populations would be um, groups like children with autism and attention deficit disorder, um, elderly groups with chronic health issues like dementia, returning veterans in post-traumatic stress disorder, people struggling with addiction, um, youth and adults with um, disabilities and people living in, in poverty. So there's a wide range of, of audiences that can benefit uh, from horticultural therapy in uh, particular. Um, and AHTA, like I said, shares all of that. We also, on at U of I on campus, we also have um, some great research going on within the landscape architecture uh, program and this U of I Landscape and Human Health Laboratory, where they're actually doing a lot of studies, a lot of research to uh, kind of sh prove the benefits of nature um, in schools, in different types of settings. So they're doing a lot of great research to kind of really prove the point that this is actually helpful so that we can get it into more, uh, more schools, more facilities. So I mentioned that um, I work for Extension and there might be master gardeners who are on the call today. And this kind of rings true for if you're a volunteer for any kind of organization or you're helping out. Um, our goal is to kind of facilitate and promote the benefits of this type of, uh, of programming. So what we typically do is we, we create gardens. So we go into uh, facilities and we create, whether it's a healing garden um, or a vegetable garden or any type of garden in that particular location where there's an audience that could, that could be helped. And then what we try to do too, since our mission is education, and to help others learn to grow is that we want to also develop some learning activities that go along uh, with it. So in any kind of activity that we're doing, we're also providing some nuggets of, uh, of knowledge, whether they're realizing it um, or not. So that's kind of our role here as Extension. We're not horticulture therapists. Like I said, we don't have that uh, particular training, but we're there to kind of facilitate, provide those activities, uh, create gardens that can be used for this type of, uh, of gardening. So if we looked at the type of gardens that you might hear uh, thrown around with this type of gardening, you might hear terms like therapeutic gardens or healing gardens, um, horticultural therapy gardens, restorative gardens, enabling gardens. Those are all different terms uh, for gardens that are used for this type of um, treatment, rehab, uh, or vocational programs. So they all have different terms. They all basically mean similar um, similar things there. So let's say you wanted to start a garden somewhere, whether it's at your home and you're going to be um, uh, doing it for yourself or, or for a neighbor, or it's at an assisted living facility or a school or somewhere else. Uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to assess the needs of whoever's going to use this garden. Okay, so we need to uh, kind of assess their physical abilities, their how they can access that particular garden. 
and then we need to look at the site. And again, this goes back to kind of the abilities of our, excuse me, our client. So if, for instance, we have um, someone in a wheelchair that needs to access this garden, we need to make sure that our, our path materials are, are appropriate, the slope of the garden is appropriate for that, the particular location is easily accessible, and the paths are wide enough that a, that a wheelchair would be able to uh, turn around. So there's a lot in terms of the site that we need to consider based on our audience. And then again, we want to assess our goals, okay, whether our goals is to um, evoke a memory in a dementia uh, population, we might think about fragrant plants or different colors, that type of thing. Um, so we need to kind of, again, l assess our, our clients and assess what their what our goal are in that particular garden. So here's an example of a nice well-paved uh, area. It's plenty wide. A wheelchair could uh, access this very easily. Uh, the hose, of course, across there is not a great thing. Uh, but otherwise, this would be a pretty accessible uh, garden. We have containers they could roll up next to. These beds are elevated. Um, uh, a wheelchair could uh, wheel right, right up to that. So that would be a, a pretty well accessible garden. If we think about designing then, so once we've looked at the site, we've figured out kind of what our challenges are here, uh, what do we need to look at, then we can start to think about plants, which for me is the, the most fun part. Um, and most of the time, we probably want as low a maintenance garden as possible, uh, and it, whether it's your garden at home or anywhere. And now, most of us don't like maintenance, so we want to try to use kind of easy to grow plants that are going to be tough drought tolerant, they're not going to need a lot of pruning or maintenance. Okay, so natives are, uh, are a good option in a lot of cases. They tend to be pretty, pretty tough plants. If it is something that we want to come back every year, a perennial, a tree, a shrub, we do want to, of course, check our hardiness zone before we plant that. So whether we're zone five, zone six, zone, zone seven, we want to make sure we're, we're planting appropriately so that we're really investing in that garden. And then we also want to look at the health of the plant. If it's an option to choose a, a disease resistance in a particular variety, go for that because, again, it's going to save you maintenance in the long, uh, the long run. Uh, grouping plants together with similar needs is important. So let's say you're doing a, a, a container on the south side of a, of a building. Uh, we're going to choose plants that are going to be in those similar need conditions that are going to go with those light conditions what the watering is like on that side of the building. We're going to choose plants that all have similar requirements so that they all succeed similarly. And think about, too, how fast things grow. Again, this goes back to low maintenance. If you're wanting um, something that's low maintenance, doesn't need pruning, deadheading, uh, you're choosing particular plants to go with that. Okay. Now, in terms of design, um, the view is important, and this, again, depends on your location, your client's needs, and all of that. But let's say you're at a uh, retirement facility, and there's a courtyard area where a lot of the windows uh, look onto it. That would be a great place for a garden, because there would be a lot of people that would benefit from the view of that, uh, of that garden. So think about uh, where you're putting it, and how accessible it is, and how viewed um, it's going to be. If you really are desiring something high maintenance, then think about containers, raised beds, going vertical um, so that it's a little easier to, to maintain. Think about containers in that case too. If, you're, if you don't have a space to put in an in-ground uh, bed, uh, containers are a great, great option to start small and then scale up later uh, if you want to. All right, and we're going to talk about the senses uh, in terms of design, putting kind of more fragrant things near the windows, the doors where people will enjoy that. Moving through the garden is a great idea. Okay. So some of those more low maintenance, manageable, manageable garden suggestions might be things like those compact evergreens that grow very slowly, uh, dwarf uh, flowering shrubs, that should say, perennial ground covers, easy low maintenance perennials, spring bulbs that, that come back every year. Those would all be examples of kind of low maintenance, more manageable things, even perennial vegetables that you don't have to replant. Uh, those would all be great things to consider. So I mentioned that term enabling uh, a garden. That's one of the, the terms we use for these gardens. So um, here we're going to think about um, things like raised beds, 
containers and um, vertical gardens. So if we look at some examples here, you'll see this uh, first one on the left here um, is a hanging basket type of, of growing system where you actually have a pulley where you can raise that hanging basket up and down. So no matter what the um, level activity per, of the particular participant, you could have it high so that they're in a standing position, which might be more comfortable or uh, bring it down lower in a seated position. In the middle, we have uh, some raised beds that would be a good example where it's a good height that you could roll up next to. There's a seat on the edge uh, that someone could sit on. And then we've also got some containers uh, here as well. And we've got a nice smooth pathway. And then this um, photo here would be a, more of a raised bed uh, option where it's almost like a table, a gardening table where the wheelchair can just roll right under, uh, right underneath that particular bed. So really, again, you're assessing the needs of your audience and um, tweaking it for their abilities. So here would be another example. We've got various heights here of a, of a raised bed that uh, you could either roll under or you could stand up uh, to work in, depending on which end uh, of the bed that you choose. So again, nice and accessible, um, easy to access. Uh, this was at a garden at a um, convalescent center. I visited the DuPage County Master Gardeners, and they have a great program uh, going on there. And they have, they were very lucky to have these great beds at that particular um, convalescent center. They're a perfect height for um, a wheelchair to just pull up right next to it, sit next to the bed, uh, and, and access their, their plants there. And you'll also notice that they're not very deep. They're not very wide, I should say. Up. So that you are just sitting next to that bed, you could easily reach towards the middle, um, towards the other side to be able to harvest, weed, um, do whatever you needed to. And in this particular case, people uh, in the facility were assigned a particular area, so they had their own little growing space, which is a great benefit. If you don't have something permanent like that, something like grow bags is a good option. You can get these in a lot of different sizes, um, shapes. They're all made of kind of a fiber fabric material that is reusable for at least several years typically. Um, and you just fill those with uh, potting mix and you can plant things in there. You can move them around, you can put these wherever. So in this case, this was a veterans program at a VA facility in um, Danville. And they were growing um, a lot of different vegetables here in these grow bags, just again, in kind of a courtyard uh, area. So they worked with what they could, could use. And again, here at that same um, facility, this was another courtyard area where there was landscaped. You had landscape rock all around the area. So you really couldn't put an in-ground bed very easily. So you bring in containers. So in this case, troughs work very well. The height is great for these, you're, it's easy, you don't have to bend over as far. Um, and the great thing about a raised bed or a container too is that you have a lot less weeds to manage. You can see the mulch, of course, around it has a lot of weeds in it, but the, the beds themselves are gonna be a lot easier to uh, maintain. So if we think about those raised beds again, or those containers, um, here would be a couple of guidelines, okay? So in terms of, of width, uh, 60 inches would be max if we're if we're thinking about a bed. So that would be five um, five feet. If I had a preference, I would always make it more narrow if you could, so that it's easier to reach. Um, I would, 60 inches to me is is a little bit wide. If you are doing a one-sided bed, so let's say it's against a building, then we're talking about arm tip to fingertip. That would be max width, so maybe two feet uh, or so. Okay. In terms of height, if our audience is going to be kneeling or seated, 18 to 30 inches is ideal. And if we want someone to stand without bending, we're talking closer to kind of the 41 inch uh, range. Okay. And we'll look some images here of platforms. Um, it's a nice idea to have an, a ledge on the side of a bed so that someone, um, if they do need to just sit down, uh, they could for a period of time while they were doing their, their gardening. So in this case on the left, they've used a wider uh, lumber to actually create the bed. So they created it uh, that way. Very easy to sit on the edge and work. And then on the one on the right here, 
uh, is more of kind of a movable solution. You can move that seat um, all around the edge of the bed and be able to just sit there and weed and, uh, and do what you need to do in that particular bed, which is pretty handy. So let's look at plants. Now we talk a lot about vegetables in these types of, uh, of gardens because of course, that's a great, uh, a great thing to do. But no matter what the plants that we're gonna be putting in there, um, thinking about the senses is a great uh, thing to think about, especially, de again, depending on your audience, if it's a dementia population, um, different senses can, can trigger different, different memories. So things like sight using brightly colored um, plants, uh, foliages, flowers, and movement is a great idea too. So putting in several types of ornamental grasses that will move um, in the wind, and it could even be non plant items too. It could be wind chimes, uh, garden accessories, that type of thing. Smell is the big one. Okay, so whether it's uh, flowers that have a great fragrance to them or herbs that have a uh, fragrance to them, those would all be good examples of, uh, of smells that we would want to try to, to get in there. Uh, touch, of course, we don't think about as much as a, as a sense, but really important uh, for, again, kind of mo um, mobility skills, dexterity skills to be able to feel different things. So soft, fuzzy foliages like artemisias, lamb's ears, rough textures like barks of paper bark maple or birch, um, things like that. So mix it up in terms of the different textures that you have. Uh, in that garden and that can help liven uh, the touch uh, sense. And then of course taste. So I mentioned vegetable gardens and herb gardens of course are, are a great thing to put in uh, because the taste sense of course is an easy one to um, to work with. So you can do tastings out in the garden, you can do recipe um, sessions, you can can things, a uh, lot you can do in terms of, of tasting things in the garden. So I mentioned um, tasting things. So edible flowers, of course, is a great thing. You can get your color, you can get your smell a lot of time, and you can also get some taste in there. But keep in mind, again, assessing your, your audience. Um, to keep in mind that particular audiences may tend to have a tendency to put things in their mouth, no matter what it is. So whatever plants you're you're putting in that garden again consider who will be there and if they have a possibility of putting anything into their mouth um, without knowing you might consider avoiding maybe some of those things that aren't uh, edible that would be more poisonous than uh, than than healthy so things like lantana and lily of the valley some of those ornamentals um, though they might be great ornamentally uh, in terms of safety um, they may not be your, your best choice. So do a little research there uh, in terms of what you're putting out into the garden. So activities, which I think is a, a great portion here, uh, is activities. And we've talked about gardens, but there doesn't necessarily need to be a garden uh, for gardening as therapy to, to happen. Uh, we do a lot of activities in, in locations where there isn't a garden. We, we just have a group of people uh, that we're, we're working with. So some of these activities are great for indoors, outdoors. So things like uh, seed starting in the winter, propagating house plants, flower arrangements is always a big hit. Um, creating dish gardens and terrariums, pressing flowers to create stationery and cards, um, creating seasonal wreaths depending on the on the season. So I mentioned that um, when we do these programs with master gardener groups and volunteer groups, we provide some education and um, visuals is a big portion of that too. So printing out pictures, having catalogs, posters um, is a great kind of add-on uh, to go along with that. Um, a couple of other activities um, would be things like garden planning, and that's what this um, photo is depicting here is our dream garden activity. Um, so the master gardeners have cut out uh, photos of flowers, vegetables from catalogs, um, and then the, the participants can then glue those onto a, a poster to create kind of their dream garden and kind of plan out what we might want to plant in the garden for the, the next year. So you could cut those out ahead of time. You could have your audience cut them out. Again, it depends on the, uh, your audience. Journaling is great. Um, creating and crafting labels that we can label the plants in the garden. And then of course there's the actual 
maintenance of the garden. Some days um, you may not need an activity. The activity may just be to simply go out into the garden and and, uh, and have some therapy that way. So weeding, watering, harvesting, um, composting, those would all be kind of important garden activities. And then insects too. Insects are always a big hit. Anything that's cool and, uh, and interesting is a great thing to do an activity around. So a couple examples here. This is one of that our Ogle County Master Gardener group um, did. They were talking about celery and how to grow celery and what part of the plant it is, that type of thing. And then, of course, they did a, an activity uh, with the residents here in this assisted living facility where they did painting using the, the actual cut up um, celery to, to make flowers. Uh, here they were talking about herbs on the right, so we were doing some tastings with herbs, we were, and we were making some herbal dried um, sachet bags that the residents could put into their, their rooms, their sock drawers, um, and then they were creating um, flowers with buttons here after we had had a, uh, a little uh, flower lesson. So there's a, in almost any aspect of gardening, you can turn into um, an activity that would work uh, for this type of thing. And again, I mentioned the visuals, the visuals. So again, this is the DuPage County group had some great uh, posters. So in the winter, when there's nothing out in the garden, there's we can't take uh, people outside, we have to bring that indoors. So we create visuals, we do activities uh, that are related to kind of indoor uh, gardening activities. And really there's a lot, uh, a lot that you can do there. So in terms of, of resources, there's a lot of areas where you can learn more about um, gardening as therapy and therapeutic horticulture. Um, this book is great for activity ideas. It's called A Calendar Year of Horticultural Therapy. So again, if you're trying to do activities year round, there's some really great um, ideas to kind of spark your uh, creativity in that particular book. Um, and then again, a lot of great resources. Uh, AHDA recommends a lot of these. So uh, enabling Garden, Gardening for a Lifetime, Principles and Practices, Horticultural Therapy Methods. Um, and if you're in Illinois here, the Ch Chicago Botanic Garden actually has a, a great certification program um, related to uh, horticultural therapy. So if you are interested in getting certified uh, and learning more, um, Chicago Botanic Garden is a great uh, resource there. And again, I mentioned AHTA, that's also a great resource. So if you're looking for that research um, ideas, this is a great place to go. They put on a conference every year um, if you're really interested in, in learning more about that. So I want to, I do want to thank, I mentioned those master gardener groups, the DuPage, Ogle, and Vermilion. I've used some photos from some of their programs um, and uh, several of my staff members, they've been um, willing to share uh, items there. So hopefully um, throughout some of this, you've hopefully maybe gained some inspiration if you've never uh, done any, any of this type of thing to, uh, like I said, start small, do it with a family member, uh, a neighbor, garden together. Um, anything you do is a great uh, therapeutic thing in terms of gardening, whether it's for yourself or for another um, group of people. So hopefully you're kind of inspired, you've got some ideas um, and things to try out. So here's my contact information. I'm always happy to um, answer questions over emails or send me ideas of what you're, um, what you're out there doing. Uh, those are all all great things. Uh, this will be this is being recorded and uh, will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, and all of our Four Seasons gardening videos are up on that YouTube channel. So if you're ever looking to learn something more about gardening, check that out. We have a variety of different topics that have been covered up there now. So with that, I will open it up to. Uh, any questions anybody has or comments. So feel free to either type that into the chat box there or you can um, unmute yourself and um, ask them that way as well.
Okay, well, I'm not seeing any, but I will stay on here for another couple minutes. If anybody um, thinks of any questions, feel free to stay on. Otherwise, thank you guys all for, for logging on tonight. So like I said, this will be posted to uh, YouTube probably sometime next week. So if you ever need to refer back to it, uh, it'll all be there. So thank you guys. Have a good night.